It's only entertainment. Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. That's right. My guest today, let's bring him on. Kevin Schultz. How you doing, Josh? Good, man. With 357. Let me get my notes up here real quick. Part of going live. So 357, tell us a little bit about what you're doing, transportation in the hemp and cannabis industry. Uh, give us a little rundown. Yes, we, we started the company back in 2019. Previous, I was in the cannabis industry for many years, uh, helping scale some well-known multi-state operators. And uh, when the hemp industry got the um, stamp of approval to transport product over state lines uh, through the farm bill, um, I knew without fancy toys like tracking and tracing and someone was going to have to really jump in that had the best interest of the industry in mind and and grab the bull by the horn and develop those SOPs so the industry can rely on us. So that's our niche. We we do that really well. And and now we've grown into the international uh, cannabis space as, as well. Brilliant. I got my notes back. It's a, the joys of going live is sometimes when you click on your notes, then you click the X and it goes away. Uh, not what I wanted, but uh, here we are. So 357, uh, Cannel Logistics, a division of the 357 company that specializes in transportation, logistics of cannabis, navigating the complexity of domestic and international shipping. So uh, I'm kind of excited to talk about what that means, because for a lot of people, it's still kind of like in their little local bubble. Um, But before we get to what makes it unique from, you know, UPS or whatever, uh, I thought we would bring in ChatGPT for a couple of slogans. So slogans for hip and cannabis transportation and delivery company, according to ChatGPT, could be, here's your slogan. Tell me if you want to, you know, take this on. You can't spell delivery without weed. Uh, No, I think that's pretty funny, but I would not. I wouldn't take it. Um, We'd rather bring it to you. I think if AI is picking up that, like, we'd be great together, it's probably overplayed, in my opinion. I agree. Cute, though. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, get your green without leaving your scene. Oh, I like that for home delivery. That's good. Uh, so let's talk about like what makes delivery unique. Again, like there's there's delivery out there, but a lot of people might not know if there's any nuances. So, mm-hmm. yeah, tell us a little, Kevin, about some of those unique transportation or logistics considerations that you have to kind of take into consideration when moving hemp and cannabis products. Well, I think when most people think of delivery, they think of that final mile, you know, the home delivery and and when is the cannabis space going to, you know, develop that infrastructure. And I think you're starting to see some of the MSOs, you know, here domestically think about that more than having patients or or customers come to the to the to the store um, to cut down on some expenses. But with us, you know, we cover that first mile middle mile and final mile as well. Um, So I I think when the supply chain, when the consumer thinks of it, they're thinking of that final mile. But what we try to educate the supply chain on is that we're kind of like that circulatory system for any industry, you know, when it comes to logistics. And when we need to move biomass, let's say from the farmer to the processor, you know, that's one leg of, of, of that journey of that product. And sometimes that that biomass, you know, gets converted into an oil that needs to go to, let's call it a co-packer. And, you know, so there's various legs of transportation and logistics that we try to get the industry, industry to think about. Um, early on, that was very hard to do. Folks had uh, other things on their to-do list, like where are we going to get genetics and who's going to buy this this uh, raw material from us, which is understandable. But, you know, we we encourage folks to get ahead of these logistics conversations and and really think bigger picture on how it's going to impact their business and ultimately total cost of doing business. Yeah. Or, or just the experience of it. So case in point, I was a judge for a, a cannabis cup here in Washington State. Uh, and I was contacting other judges. Um, I was doing flour and I contacted, you know, concentrates and whoever else. So one of the concentrate judges had some hash and this hash was just a, a big ball of of nothing, you know. And, and so uh, when they found out who it was, they reached out and said, why did you send this hash in like this big mass? And they said they didn't. It was, it was beautifully laid out. But between the the, the manufacturer um, who brought it in a cooler and then the, the people that were organizing the cup, giving it to the judges, it 
it melted. You lose a lot of terpenes, uh, you know, for some of those full melt hashes at really low temperatures. Just just the temperature of your car can um, can change the the consistency, flavor, all of that. Kind of like a bloom chocolate. If if it melts, whatever, then you open it up. And you're like, what is this? Mm-hmm. Uh, so when you talk about last mile deliveries and, and those kind of capabilities, um. Is there any specialized equipment that you need or required or um, is there safety or efficiency or um, anything that that different is different from from anything else that we're we're used to? You know, I think it goes back to our familiarity with the plant. Um, We're not like normal logistics companies that are trying to attempt to ship this commodity. So my personal, you know, familiarity with being in the industry, we know how to ask those questions ahead of time. And and even if the person that's scheduling us for the transportation isn't thinking about it, we're bringing those types of things to their attention. Um, One of my partners has been doing cold chain transportation for a long time. Um, I I think it's very similar to shipping any other type of specialty um, product that needs refrigeration or temperature control. Um, so we're always thinking about those things. Um, we take it extremely serious that we want that product to end up where it's going in the state that it was when we picked it up. Um, but I think there's part of that game planning and in, in, in asking the right questions and preparing the, the shipper too as well and providing introductions for that shipper to get the right pra- packaging and, and, and the right way of shipping it, you know, under control on their end before we even come and pick it up. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if, um, if shipping has changed over the last couple of years, I've been trying to take my own survey, if you will, and ask about, you know, just in time delivery or just what we knew about the transportation industry as a whole over the last few years, as it kind of fell apart with the supply chain constraints, we see cannabis product uh, products that are delicate can easily degrade during transport. Um, you can see uh, challenges for logistic companies that require special measures to ensure that products arrive in good condition and the art of balancing that packaging, the costs, the weight to ensure that there was right conditions set through the supply chain and prevent spoilage uh, and yet not cost too much where it doesn't make that business plan feasible. Mm-hmm. Um, when we're talking about normalcy and just in time delivery and how things used to be, has COVID changed that um, or at least changed the status quo of supply chain management strategy? I think prior, it's a good question. I think prior to COVID, you know, everybody wanted everything, you know, right away and for the least cost possible. And I think COVID one thing it did bring besides a few other things to the logistics industry was a little bit more patience from the, 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 the folks who, who works who were waiting for a delivery. I do think that's starting to go back to its original mindset a little bit more as Amazon starts to, you know, really push things same day now. Um, you know, I think there's just some commodities that to do it the right way, you know, you, you may have to go a little slower. Um, and and I especially in cannabis and hemp, I, I I don't feel that there's anything fast and quick about it. You know, I think it's got to be thoughtful. Um, you got to make sure you all your P's and, and Q's are crossed and, and you're and you're really paying attention to detail, because especially when we're going over over state lines or going between countries, you know, we, you want to minimize as many mistakes as possible, you know, and, and get ahead of those. If you are going to anticipate, you know, some challenges, you know, trying to clear those up before you push play on, on the actual shipment. So, um, you know, we we always just do what we do. You know, we're very thoughtful. Uh, we want to make sure that when we're shipping something, that consumer is able to do it or that customer is able to do it again and again. This isn't just get it in once and, and whew, thank God it worked. You know, we, we work with with clients who are trying to scale businesses and, and want to be able to be, you know, partnered to them and, and be make sure that this is reproducible for them. So mm-hmm. hopefully that answered your question there. Yeah, wondering if um, you're using technology to make that even easier uh, to kind of keep that that on pace and, and repeated. Um, is there machine learning or artificial intelligence that you guys are helping with navigation or any any part of, or aspect of that supply chain? Maybe you can kind of talk about um, big data analytics, how to optimize shipping mm-hmm. or 
improve delivery or cost reductions or any kind of competitive advantage that you have using technology? Yeah, so we we have our we've developed our own proprietary technology that does a lot of what you just mentioned. Um, and, and in addition to that, I'm a huge advocate for blockchain for tracking and tracing the, mm. the life of these products. You know, I think we really got to in order to get these Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 companies into the mix of, let's say, CBD, they're really going to want to know that where the journey of this products come from. And I, the only place I think that we could put that to, you know, have one source of truth is on the blockchain here. Eventually, there are some companies that are starting to come to us and, and initiate those conversations. That would make our life a lot easier um, when it comes to the. Can paperwork. I just clarify blockchain? Because a lot yeah. of people associate that with crypto. So blockchain, yeah. just for those that don't know, is an automated Excel spreadsheet that just kind of keeps track of. Um, transactions, essentially. That's Correct. a really simplified version of it, but has absolutely nothing to do with cryptocurrency. Go ahead, Correct. Ken. Thanks for clarifying that. It's basically a record of truth. So if you're buying you know, $100,000 worth of, of, of raw material from somebody in, in the cannabis or hemp supply chain, you're able to go all the way back to from when that product was a seed and, or, or, a, or a starter plant and how, where that was grown, you know, its entire life, how it was converted to the oil. And, and really that entire journey is documented in, in, in you can't um, tamper with it. So that, that would be extremely, uh, um, make our lives a lot easier. And I think it would encourage more general legalization at the federal level, especially here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And so there's no um, expiration of blockchains. It's transparent. It's um, it's immediate, all of those things. So for those who haven't checked it out, it's um, that's really kind of what's going to dominate the, the future price of some of those cryptocurrencies backed by that technology. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see how that rolls out. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how some new markets roll out as well in terms of um, high demand that you're seeing for locations. I asked chat GPT, I have my own idea uh, like Alaska and the Aleutian chains and how, how difficult it would be to transport things to uh, different villages and, and things in remote areas. But when I asked chat GPT, what are some of the high demand areas? It mentioned uh, pop population, economic activity, and transportation infrastructure with industry culture as its top priority. And so it listed the obvious being uh, California, Texas, New York, Florida, Illinois, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. Um, hmm. Sounds like you, all the big medical markets that, that came on board early on. Yeah. Do you think that it's uh, that you're, I mean, not think, but where are you seeing some of that demand coming from? Is it, is it traditional, you know, um, markets or is it the you know the places like Alaska that I think of that that need this? You know, for us uh, on the hemp side, you know, everything below 0.3 percent, you know, THC, it's really a lot of where that biomass originated it, and that's where we're going in with our full truckloads and, and moving that biomass to a processor. Which uh, you know, some of the states that we we tend to see that product go into, you did name um, some, you did not. You know, you're thinking of Kentucky, Tennessee, Florida. Um, you know, I, I'd say probably close to half of the the United States states we've delivered into um, various different states of the product within the supply chain. So. Um, I think more when you're thinking cannabis, I think that's where the chat was going, you know, busier states, intra transportation, where, where the, the AI might've been going on that one, but, you know, really it also mentioned, uh, remote and difficult areas. It did mention Alaska, Canada, or Australia. And then it said legalization, wherever there's legalization, you're going to need it. So it mentioned Canada, Uruguay, South Africa, uh, yeah. and there are some other states. a lot of, a couple of those countries you mentioned we've delivered into, um, you know, one thing that I think about as a potential bottleneck for the industry is, is those hard to get to areas. You know, there, there's a lot of, especially on the industrial hemp side, you know, those farmers really need to be within about 50 miles of that next part of the supply chain where they need to get that raw material to go before transportation costs are really starting to eat up your budget and your margin. So, you know, those remote areas are, are, are although, yeah, they absolutely need transportation help. There's going to be tough to scale businesses in those areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you could go back in time and use a trebuchet and try to just slingshot it to somebody, but the accuracy might not be there, although the cost reduction would. would. So you got to balance that out. Um, 
So I asked ChatGPT what some funny slogans might be. You let me know if you want to adopt any of these and we'll work it out with ChatGPT well, on what the royalty would be. Uh, it said, relax, we'll get it there. I think that's great. I think that's funny. It's great, but I don't know if it works too well with the, yeah. with the person who paid you to ship it. Yeah, you're like, relax, it's going to get there. It's fine. <laughs> uh, it said, um, from seed to sale, we handle the logistics. Again, like if, it's, if AI is picking up from seed to sale, it's probably played out. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend yeah, using it. Played out, but it's definitely uh, important. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it describes A to Z. It's that same thing. A to Z is played out too, but everybody uses it. Right. Uh, and then finally, uh, slogans that ChatGPT came up with for hemp and cannabis transportation companies. Fast, discreet, and highly reliable. It's got a sense of humor. <laughs> cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, avoiding domestic arrest has got to be top on your priority, Kevin. Um, yeah. Do you avoid Idaho entirely? I mean, we've seen compliance and regulations related to domestic cannabis transport and hemp. Uh, while there's been a lot of you know set uniform laws in, in individual areas, hard to kind of track and follow. And then try telling a local cop in a neighboring state that your med medical marijuana is medicine and see how long it takes you to get in handcuffs. You still have to avoid arrest and delays while shipping through or around Idaho. Mm -hmm. What do you guys do to ensure compliance with legal and regulatory requirements for transporting hemp or, or cannabis across state lines or even interstate for cannabis? How does that work out? And, and international borders for that matter. So early on, I'd say 2019 to 2020, Idaho was the big stay away from state. Although the farm bill is clear that we're able to bring, you know, products less than 0.3% THC through their state, they were somebody that it would just wasn't worth dealing with. Um, so we, we avoided it for a long time. We don't anymore. Um, you know, one thing our operations team is kind of obsessed with is making sure we're staying, you know, abreast of all the potential uh, nuances that each state is asking for. So a lot of folks are under the impression that the farm bill says I can do it. Let's go. We quickly understood early on that each state might have their own ask of us. And, and we always want to make sure that we're in compliance with that. Um, we, we, we always act as if we're sitting in front of a judge and, and stating our case because, you know, we want to make sure that every, everything we're doing is above board. We stay out of, and because of that, we stay out of a lot of gray areas that the supply chain does uh, operate in. You know, we're, we're advocates for the industry. We're cheering for the industry. But when you're bringing product over state lines and it's in a gray area and drug trafficking is is looking you right in the eye, um, we stay away from that. So we're always in the mindset of what's the best for the longevity of the industry. And that's just how we've always operated. Um, you know, I'll give you one early example. When we were talking with the state of Florida and, and having meetings early on, you know, they, they wanted us to operate off a total THC formula. And they wanted us to stop at a checkpoint on the way in. And we, some states were still operating under Delta 9 only. Um, and there wasn't any checkpoints. So, you know, that's kind of what, that's what you get when you work with us, that knowledge that we've gained over the years and, and how to optimize those routes to, you know, maintain, you know, keep your costs down, but also keep you out of harm's way. And the last thing you want is even if you are in the right, your product being, you know, put in quarantine and spoiling potentially. Um, so, and, and I, I want to make sure we mentioned we do have hemp cargo insurance, which I think is something that's missing in the industry. And that does protect these loads when they're in transit. Gosh forbid something happens. Um, our, our customers are able to file a claim and everything again is above board and, and they're able to get reimbursed for the value of their product. Normally insurance is so boring. Um, but in this case, I find like crop loss insurance to be fascinating and yeah. transportation of insurance because, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago that it was illegal. So, I mean, all of those things are, are at this point, like really interesting. Derek wants to know about transportation needs. He's curious about driver compliance and what that looks like when hiring a carrier. Are you guys asset based at 357 or are needs hired out to transportation companies? Yeah, so it's a good question. So drivers have to be educated thoroughly prior. And, and we set the drivers up for success with some of our SOPs that we've developed. Um, we do have one early on investor that is asset-based that if we have the opportunity to use his assets, we will. 
Um, over the years, we've trained a pretty extensive carrier network um, that knows how to do this type of, uh, of commodity shipping. And we lean on that network quite a bit. Um, but there is some extensive training that we put them through um, with the documentation that they have to have on hand and, you know, QR codes and, and whatever we can do to make sure that when they do get pulled over, that everything is um, perfect as possible. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, so let's look at internationally and what will happen. We're looking at cannabis still illegal in a lot of countries. And even though it's legal in the U.S. or regulated, there's strict regulations governing its production, distribution, and use, making it difficult to import or export cannabis products across borders and international mm -hmm. lines as well. So when we look at international shipments of cannabis products, they're subject to scrutiny by customs, like you mentioned, border control officials who may seize or delay shipments, like, like you talked about, um, if they're even suspect or contain uh, illegal substances. So that can create additional costs, obviously, and you mentioned you know, having insurance to, to uh, facilitate that. What do you foresee, though, in the future? Uh, do you foresee the ability to transport cannabis plants and product coast to coast? across inter international lines freely without prosecution? Do you have a, a crystal ball for when that might happen? Are you hearing lobbyists talking about it? Because on the West Coast, California signed um, an international uh, or um, interstate commerce. Oregon, I think, was the first. And it's on a bill in Washington State right now where I'm at, uh, making that potentially a whole West Coast transit line if the feds get mm -hmm. out of the way. What do you see and when? What are you hearing? Well, I, I mean, I've heard the same things up in the Northwest, and that seems to be where everything gets started. Um, I'm looking forward to that day. I think there's some there's, there's some markets um, that could use that extra supply of product that tends to bulk up in those areas. Um, I do think there's going to have to be some um, stamp of approval on the federal side for that to not be drug trafficking. Um, so we'll probably stay away from, from that until there is more movement uh, on the federal side. Um, you know, as far as the crystal ball goes, you know, I've always said that one day we're going to wake up and it's all going to be over. You're, you're going to be able to operate at the federal level and um, it's legal. You know, that being said, I, I look at markets that have different tracking and tracing systems already in place. And that's going to be super important for that day to come. So how does a state like Illinois share product with, you know, a state like Oregon if they're on two different operating systems? So, you know, that's just where my head's at. There's more than just saying, all right, go. It's federally legal. Tracking and tracing is extremely important in, in the industry when there's products above 0.3%. Um, you know, country to country, it's, it's really interesting. It, it, over in the international market, it's really one word outside of the industrial hemp side of things. It's, it's cannabis, you know, it's either below 0.3 or it's above 0.3. And we're really starting to see an uptick in, in business there in those markets and certain countries working with each other, you know, more than others are. And some countries have agreements between medical licenses um, to be able to ship product back and forth to each other that is above 0.3% THC. So um, one prediction I do feel is that we're going to start to see some of the major players from the U.S., some of the MSOs, start to open up cultivation overseas somewhere, whether it's Costa Rica or Colombia, and start to get into those markets. Um, that would be one, one guess I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And looking at, um, again, the future of, of transportation and delivery, if um, what's your opinion, Kevin, if will low future commodity prices and high inflation make cannabis transportation services prohibitive? Um, as far as the cost to, to transport, you know, I think when we were going, yeah, we, through... don't, we don't ship like really cheap stuff. I mean, I guess we cheap, we ship cheap stuff from, from China, but it takes three months to get here. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. So it, when you have an expiration date, can you ship cheap things when gas prices are so high? Well, I, I think you saw, you know, the over the ocean prices during the peak of COVID, you know, go 10 X at, at times, you know, the, the prices were, you know, you couldn't absorb that as a business. You know, everything we're doing right now typically is through the airlines. Um, so that's not a um, inexpensive way to ship things, but it is the quickest and it's going to make sure that that product isn't spoiling. Um, so, you know, I think there's a multitude of reasons why logistics prices go up or down. Um, I think right now we're sitting in a good spot for, for, for price points. Um, but, 
you know, those fluctuate. We've always uh, operated under the mindset that no matter what the commodity is we're shipping, you know, our margins are going to stay the same. So although there's a lot of extra work for us to ship the uh, cannabis products and, and, and hemp products, um, we realize that this needs to be a long-term play for us and the industry needs a partner that's not going to gouge them. Um, so that's where our mindset's always been. And uh, that's why we've been able to keep customers for quite a few years and ultimately grow based off referrals. So that's been cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. I got a couple more slogans from chat GPT you can choose from. Uh, Don't drive high. Let us bring the supply. Ooh, I like that one. Yeah, this next one is super creepy. From our van to your hand. Ooh, that reminds me of Halloween as a kid. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's still creepy. Um, skip the trip, just hit our zip. Ooh, weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, that's AI for you. Um, so I've asked you a couple of, of, uh, of times, like, you know, what you think the future is going to be looking like for transportation, uh, the expense, um, and I haven't heard anything about drones, so I'm I'm mm -hmm. curious about delivery innovation, efficient shipping, um, unconventional delivery methods like drones or emerging technology. Uh, I, although a lot of the delivery technology has been pulled because some of those were that were on the road were getting you know people were kicking them, <laughs> knocking them right. over and stuff. Like it's the same thing with some of the scooters they found like in the water, people just throwing right. them in the lake or ocean or whatever not really respecting the autonomous businesses. It's the reason why we don't have vending machines here and in Japan, they're proliferous everywhere. You could be hiking on Mount Fuji in the middle of nowhere and next to a tree somewhere, there's a vending machine. Wow. You know, like no, no one's going to, I don't know how they get electricity or power to it. It's, it's magic, uh, but nobody vandalizes it whatsoever. Having wow. said that, what kind of technology in the U S would, would work? Um, are you guys looking at drones or, or what else? You know, the drones is, are, are interesting. I think there's a future for them. I think a lot of the reasons you just mentioned, they haven't caught on yet. Um, I do think in logistics, there is that human factor you're never going to get rid of. Um, you know, you, you you need to be there for your customers. There needs to be a human on the other line. And in, in that responsiveness needs to be quick. Um, technology now, on the other hand, I, I think there was an explosion of freight tech companies. And that, that compiled a lot of data that made people make more actionable you know, have more actionable insights when they're making decisions. We took a little bit of a different approach when we started the company. We really wanted to listen to our customers, both on the, the carrier side and on the shipper side, and really understand the needs and service requirements and and build a technology that, that solved those needs that they expressed to us. So we went out and built those partnerships first and foremost, built a significant book of business, and then went and built our own proprietary technology that does a lot of automation and, and gets us uh, smarter and quicker. Um, but th that was just the approach we decided to take. We thought that was more meaningful. And, um, you know, we're, we're excited to really see that technology scale. And as the industries that we work in scale, you know, we, we operate outside of hemp and cannabis as well. We're in what we call the general freight industry too, and work for major apparel companies and cosmetic companies and food box kits. And, you know, we're doing some other things, especially direct to the consumer. So technology is extremely important, especially in that last mile segment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So wrapping all of that up, how's, how's the future of 357 going to look? We're looking at shipping. So I was looking at shipping companies as a whole uh, and figuring out like where you're going to fit into that. So when we're looking at um, shipping as one of the few sectors, which is truly undervalued, yet mm -hmm. operating at full capacity with rates at extremely attractive levels. So with all of the supply bottlenecks we've seen and port congestions that happen, um, rates and demand are are were high kind of falling down now but um poised to bring in record amounts of revenue and innovation mm -hmm. so what are your thoughts kevin about the shipping industry did we reach a peak are we going to reach a recession and, and there's going to be uh, consolidation over the next few years um overall where do you think the industry is going to go and how are you strategically positioned to leverage uh, whatever happens. You know, I think there's always going to be ebbs and flows in logistics. And, and for us, what we need to really worry about is how do we continue to bring that value to our partners? And there's a lot of complexity that we handle 
and take off the to-do list of both our carrier partners and our shippers. And if they can go back to working on their core business and maybe cutting some expenses on that end and becoming smarter in other areas and know that their logistics is being handled and, and not only handled, but we provide multiple options for them. I, I think you started to see during COVID folks start to shippers start to stop relying on UPS and FedEx as their only options, you know, kind of going with that partner that, was more local in certain markets and and really uh, understood those markets. And those are the kind of partners that we work with. And, and I think if we can continue to build those types of relationships, add continue to add value to our customers and really act as a business partner to them, I, I think we're going to be all right. You know, there's things we need to, needed to invest in, which was that proprietary technology to, you know, stay at the forefront of, of, of tech. You know, it's super important. I don't want to underestimate that. It helps keep our costs down. It, it helps make our, you know, customers, you know, better at what they're doing and, and get things there quicker and, and more affordable for them. So um, I'm excited because I, I think we've built something special. And, um, you know, as, as word gets out of who the 357 company is and we have more success stories, I think the growth could be, you know, pr pretty good. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see what happens. All right. Um, well, I think with that, we're gonna have to roll this one up. Um, where can people find you at? Yeah, you can uh, call us always at 844-357-SHIP, um, 357company.com. You can reach out to us for just a conversation or an actual quote. I'll be speaking at NOCO at the end of the month, um, which is a big event for both hemp and cannabis. And then we're probably going to be out in, in Columbia uh, in, in May as well. So reach out. Uh, you got a friend in the supply chain and we're always there to, to start with the conversation and get an understanding for your needs and service requirements. So, All right. I want to thank my guest, Kevin Schultz, president of 357 Company. But with that, I think we're out of here. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Season 1 of Dope History is now available at dopehistory.com. Dope History weaves you through the lives of those who have been touched by cannabis or have had an influence on the events that shaped our laws or relationships with this plant. You'll hear tales from Frenchie Cannoli, Keith Strop, Eddie Lepp, Tom Alexander, Ed Rosenthal, Wolf Seagull, Jorge Cervantes, and Tommy Chong. Available now at dopehistory.com.